turn with me to Psalm 139, if you would. Psalm 139, and we're going to see this story of David as David wrestled with his own emotions in Psalm 139. We're in the Bible app as well. Don't forget, you click on more, click on events, you can engage with us. Uh, Psalm 139, beginning at verse number 19. Now, if you have not highlighted, underlined, circled, memorized, and my challenge for you before the end of the month is to memorize verses 23 and 24. But if you have not done that, I want you to do so. In Psalm 139, beginning at verse 19, but our major scripture is verse 23 and 24 today. And I want to read for you beginning at verse number 19. It says this from the New International Version. If only you, God, would slay the wicked away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. Uh, they speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Uh, don't I hate those who hate you, Lord? Don't I abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. But then I love verse 23, but search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me, and then lead me in the way everlasting. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts, and see if there's any offensive thing in me, and lead me in the way that's everlasting. I put a title on this this morning. It's very simple. Just chill. That's it. Just, just chill. That's what we want to wrestle with this morning. Just just chill. Let me give you the context. If you want to see the context, it's in 2 Samuel chapter 16, but let me try to sum it down. But if you haven't read the context of the story, feel free to read it. We're in 2 Samuel 16. So here's the context for our text. The Bible tells us that David is traveling in near Jerusalem, this place called Bahiram, and he's dealing with so much for and against him. First of all, a brother named Shimei, who's a cousin of a former king of Israel named Saul, is hurling insults and curses at David. On top of that, David has issues with his own son named Absalom, because Absalom, who's David's son, is attempting to get back at his father and take his father's throne because of his anger towards his father when his father was silent when his sister was raped. So Absalom's been angry for years. To make matters worse, a sister named Ziba comes to David and makes it seem as if Mephibosheth is going to come against David and try to take David's throne. So now Ziba, and David's now frustrated because he finds out Ziba's purpose was to manipulate David to make some poor decisions so that Mephibosheth and Ziba could do something that Mephibosheth was just unaware about. So then on top of all of that, in 2 Samuel chapter 16, the text says that Shimei is now walking across, walking down the very places where David is, and he's hurling insults and accusations at David. He's calling David a scoundrel. He's calling David a murderer because Shimei had hated David for years, but now he's finally showing how much he hates him by cursing him and accusing David of a bunch of things. In 2 Samuel 16, here's what he did. First of all, Shimei was wrong because David actually treated Saul's family with great love and grace. Shimei was wrong because David was not a bloodthirsty man. David was a man of war, but he wasn't bloodthirsty. Shimei was wrong because David did not bring Saul and his family to ruin. Saul ruined himself. But Shimei was right that the Lord had brought this weight on David, but not for the reasons that Shimei thought that the Lord had brought this weight on David. Because God had brought this emotional weight, this, this battle weight on David for reasons to test David. to let So David let Shimei keep talking about him and cursing him. See, David let Shimei talk about him because he was not a bloodthirsty man. Because if David was a bloodthirsty man, David could have killed Shimei right on the spot. David let Shimei keep talking because he saw the hand of God in every circumstance. And he knew that God was more than able to shut Shimei up, but David didn't need to waste his time with Shimei. David let Shimei speak because he put his Shimei problem in perspective, and David knew that his real issue was his son Absalom and not Shimei. So David did not lose perspective and give too much energy to the wrong enemy. And David let Shimei speak because he knew that God's hand was on his future and his present, and David did not want to mess up his future trying to fight and kill the wrong enemy that could screw up his future in the present. See, David, y'all, kept a clear mind knowing that restoration of his name would not come from emotional retaliation. The restoration of his family would not come from jealousy and anger. His family problems, his people problems, his leadership issues would be solved by doing one thing. And the text says in 2 Samuel chapter 16, around verse number 14, the text says, and then David refreshed himself. 
And the text, the scholars believe that it's here in this refreshing in verse number 14 that Psalm 139 was birthed. It was birthed because David remained strong in the face of opposition. It was birthed because David remained strong around people who were trying to insult him and accuse him of false things. David remained strong when his emotions could have overtaken him, when David could have killed him, when David could have knocked him all out. And David decided to let the emotional weight of his life lead him to do one thing, and that was he allowed his emotions to lead him to a posture of prayer. And in this posture of prayer, he did not go down a path of emotional destruction. His refreshing pushed him to a place, watch this, where David did not do what he knew he was capable of doing or what Shimei accused him of doing. David allowed his emotions to lead him to talk to God. Manage your emotions so well that here's a second principle I want to give you, that your emotions lead you to plan your time, to pause before you respond, and pray unto your God. I'm going to give you this again. I want you to get this all week. Manage your emotions so well that your emotions cause you to plan your time, pause before you respond, and pray unto your God. Psalm 139, church, is one of the most elegantly written psalms that deal directly with the sovereignty, the peace, the omniscience, the omnipresence, the all-powerful nature of God. All these are the big words about God and knowing how this psalm is written and the passion behind this psalm that David is refreshing himself by reminding himself of how awesome God really is. So look at the text. David begins. If you have your Bibles, I want to walk through this with you so you can see it. Look at the motions of Psalm 139 so you know I did my homework. David begins in verses 1 through 6 by stating what God knows about David. Look what he says. He tells God that you know me. You have covered me, and I can't even begin to handle everything you know about me. Continuing the text in verses 7 through 12, David shows the movement of God. He tells God that I can't escape God, and that his presence is so powerful that all I can do is honor the presence of God. Then David transitions to tell us how much he knows about God. In verses 13 through 18, he tells God that God knows everything. He knows everything about him so much that he can't even understand how God even can hold all that God knows. And then David gets to our text and he says, like a whole lot of us, God, you know how good you are, how awesome you are, how great you are. But God, listen, I want something from you. And David tells God, listen, I need something, God. You know, we try to butter God up in our prayers. God, I love you so much. God, you're the air that I breathe. You're so awesome. But God, listen, I need something. And look what David says in verse 19. God, if you would just, you know, get rid of my enemies, right? God, I know you awesome and all that. You all powerful. But if you would just get rid of my enemies, God, I would be so good right now. Because, and matter of fact, I like how David does this because he does it like a lot of us. God, because, you know, we the same way. I don't like them and you don't like them either. So since we both don't like our enemies, will you just get rid of our enemies, God? I love the way it's written. But the way the Hebrew writes this text is so interesting because in this moment where David begins to see his flesh rising, his anger rising, the way the Hebrew writes this text is that David stops abruptly and there's a Selah moment. There's a pause in this text. And in this text, David stops. And before he lets his anger overtake him, before he lets his flesh overtake him, David says, no, God, before you take my enemies out, search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me. And then lead me in the paths of righteousness. It's, it's interesting because I believe so many of us have been in situations like David where we love God so much. We care about God so much. And yet we have some people and some situations around us that force us to stop concentrating on God and concentrate on the issues around us. But David shows us, I can never allow my enemies to overpower the goodness of God. I'm going to say this again. You can never allow your enemies to overpower, to get you off focus from the goodness of God. As a matter of fact, your enemy loses when you decide to tell God not to handle your enemy, but to empower me to be big enough where my enemy can't control my emotions. I'm talking good. Y'all ain't talking back. I said, as a matter of fact, your enemy loses when you decide not to tell God to handle your enemy, but God empower me to be big enough where I don't let my enemy control my emotions. And so let me talk about this enemy thing this month because I've been out too often we let our enemies only be people. Let me tell you something. An enemy to your future can be your lack of time management, your pride, your arrogance. Enemies ain't always people. And David makes a difficult decision in this place of his life. How do you handle life when the enemies for your future show up, when God dispatches enemies to test 
test your emotions. And David acknowledges that to get to my future, I'm going to make the difficult decision, watch it, not to fight my enemies, but to hope for healing through God. Because the only way I'm going to win this thing and stay to be a winner beyond this moment is if I let God lead me and don't let my flesh lead me. So no, this isn't a series about how to handle your haters. I ain't doing that. Because we talk about haters and forget that sometimes we the ones hating other people. This ain't a series on how to deal with your enemies. Rather, it's how do you respond to the perils of life when you throw a curveball that you don't think you deserve, but God says it's going to prepare you for the next level. That there are seasons of your life where God will force you into some shimmy eye situations to see where is your mind and you won't lead with your emotions. Because God's commitment to your future is evident in the personal relationship you have with God. Let me suggest that so often our faith is based upon God delivering us from Shimei that we don't have faith to trust God beyond Shimei to plan our time, to pause and then respond into prayer. Is your faith in God based upon God setting you free? Is, your, is the way you approach God based upon your love for God? Or is the way you pray into God based upon God opening up doors and delivering you? And too many of us have a faith that requires deliverance and substance over a relationship with God. And therefore, we ask God for stuff. We don't ask God for the right things. We have a faith that wants us to see us get up, get out, get new levels, get new seasons. God, kill my enemies. And then if God doesn't do it, we get mad at God. We get mad at the church. The church don't know Jesus. The preacher ain't pre preaching the gospel. The choir don't know how to sing. I hate the local church. The black church is the blame for everything. And we hate God when the issue is not the, the issue is not the church. The issue is you don't desire to have a relationship with God. You just want God to keep setting you free. But I like David in this text because David stops before he goes down, empowering his emotions, his pride, and his anger. And he says, God, deal with me so I can handle this thing with wisdom. Because watch this. These aren't my last enemies because my call is greater than my temporary hell. I wish I I had somebody that your gift in you is bigger than the shimmy against you. I wish I had somebody that the anointing on you is bigger than the folk around you who can't stand you. The, that you cannot make permanent decisions in temporary places because this ain't your last battle. I wish I had this ain't your last war. This ain't your last fight. This ain't your last place. Am I talking to anybody in the building? This won't kill me because I still got the future ahead of me. So I'm not going let my emotions stop me from where God is trying to take me. So today is a call to look at yourself. Look at what God has told you about your calling, your passions, your love, your life. Look at how God has empowered you, how God has strengthened you, how God has loved you. And God says, I'm working on your behalf. And if you let me work with you, we'll get to your future and your emotions will dictate or slow down where I'm trying to take you because I'm going to watch this. I'm going to push you through stuff that you used to have to crawl through. Take the time to chill out with God, for God to mess with you, for God to be God through and in you. Because here it is, your emotional moments, you have the authority to make sure your emotional moments don't stop the momentum of God in your life. So chill, chill out, calm down, take a deep breath. How can I do this, Pastor Justin? How can I refresh myself? Look at the text. The first thing David does, I'm almost finished. David, first of all, in the text, he acknowledges the ability of God. Look at verse 19. He acknowledges the ability of God. Verse 19 says this. David says, so search me, O God. David acknowledges the only means of me understanding who God is, is if I let God be God. What can God do, David? David says, God can search. It's so deep that God can enter into the places that I can't, I don't even know how to reach in my own life. And David calls upon his knowledge of God, not only to bless him, but to search the depth of his heart and the depth of his soul. And David acknowledges the only true freedom from his enemies and freedom from his issues and freedom from his emotions. David can't figure it out. He can't figure out why he won't kill Shimei because he knows that's how I normally respond to situations. And David says, I'm not going to respond this way, but I don't know why. 
why I won't respond the way I'm used to responding. So David says, God, if you would just search me to help me to be the me you need me to be. See, David understand who God is and he understand he doesn't call upon a God of somebody else. David calls upon a personal God, something he knows about God, that he knows that if I call upon God to find it, God's going to find it. David sees that his relationship with God is not just an outward thing, it's an inward thing. And I understand that sounds like a very basic thing, Pastor Justin, but let me tell you something. I think we forget it, that your faith is a personal thing. You're not living on your mama's faith. You're not living on your daddy's faith, but when you grow your own personal faith, you have a firm foundation that Paul Tillich said, that great German theologian, that faith is of the ultimate concern, that faith is cognitive, faith is active, and David begins to call upon a personal God that David has been present with, and David knows for some reason, the same God that anointed me at a young age, the same God that let me face battles without much effort, the same God that let me kill Goliath, fight the bears, fight the lions, and fight in the wilderness, is the same God. And so David says, God, since you've been God to me, since I've had experiences with you, God, search me because I know next level is in front of me, and I don't want to screw it up because my anger wants to take over me. So David says, God, search me, oh God. That should be somebody shout this morning that instead of you getting upset that you're so blessed, instead of you getting upset that God has set you free, learn to shout, God, search me. God, what am I missing from me that the devil is trying to take from me? Because for some reason, you love me so much that you won't let my battles kill me. For some reason, you love me so much that you didn't let cancer kill me, God. For some reason, you love me so much that you didn't let the insecurity kill me. For some reason, you love me so much that they won't let me go. And so, God, I can't figure it out. So, God, search me. When you scream out, God, search me, here's what you're saying. You testify like my grandmama used to testify. The reason I want God to search me is so that I can testify. What a friend. I wish y'all we have in Jesus all our sins. Y'all missing me. And griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. Because the only reason you have what you have, you own what you own, you wear is because God's been your friend. The only reason you ain't lost your mind, he's been your friend. The only reason you at the school you at is he's been your friend. So what a friend we have in Jesus. David shows me you are never so strong that you can't get stronger. God, I wish y'all hear me. I said you're never so strong that you can't get stronger. Watch this. And a matter of fact, it is your strength gets strengthened when you're humble enough to acknowledge your weaknesses. Because in my weakness, he makes me strong. God, I wish y'all his grace is me. Am I talking to anybody in the building this morning who can testify? God will always strengthen you in your weak areas. So I know you're a great leader, but God, search me so I can be a better leader. God, I, I know you're a great mother, but God, search me so I can be a better mother. God, I know you're a great person, but God, search me so I can be a better person. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. And oh, what needless pains we bear. Because we don't take all of our insecurity and our strength and our weaknesses to God in prayer. But when you take it to the Lord in prayer, he'll snatch that. Am I talking to anybody in the building who can testify that God God will snatch the weight off your shoulders. And it's here, it's here that the liberation of the true self is formed. Can you trust God with what you're good at? And so often we, we preach these sermons about trusting God with our weaknesses and trusting God what I can't do. But do you have the wisdom and the humility to say, God, I'm going to give you my strengths? Because true self exudes out when we let God get into the intricacies of who we are to know our hearts, our passions, our love, our emotions, our intentions, our cares. So God, while I acknowledge that you know me, there's something in me that's holding me back from where you need me to be. So God, I can't figure it out. So God, serve Search me, oh God, and find out everything about me. Have you allowed God into the depths of who you are beyond the walls that you've built to keep him out? 
Meaning, have you let God into you so deep that only God can find some places that you don't even know existed? There's a divine operation woven in self-understanding. Now, before you tune me out thinking this is some love yourself sermon, this isn't some love yourself sermon, but I believe in self-love. But I also believe that what we've done in this society is that we've manipulated self-love to just be a way to get out of a conversation with somebody. I mean, you know, like when somebody can't get married, well, just go love yourself, right? When somebody can't get something, just go love yourself. And we've let self-love become this, this faux self-hatred, right? That loving yourself is not what it really means. In a true sense, it becomes an excuse for when we talk about someone loving themselves. And what I wish to empower you with today is what self-love really is. Let's make self-love powerful. What would your life look like if you loved yourself as a means to liberate yourself from what the devil says you can't do, but so to liberate yourself so you can show the world what God is still able to do? And let me suggest the way we're seeking the self has become nothing more than an intellectual statement that's forced us to acknowledge our inability instead of embracing our ability. So we love ourselves by talking about ourselves. So I'm really great, you know, but I'm kind of fat. I'm really good, but I know I ain't the prettiest person in the world. I'm, I'm kind of dark, but I know I'm good at something. And we begin to talk about what my mama said I couldn't do because I was abandoned. I was depressed. I can't lose weight. I'm fresh out. I didn't grow up on one side of the railroad tracks that we don't love ourselves because self-love has become a faux self-hatred. And my professor, Stacey Floyd Thomas, said it like this. She said, we cannot value ourselves right without first breaking through the, the ways of denial that hide the depth of black self-hatred, inner anguish, and unreconciled pain. Think about the ways that some of us view ourselves and talk about ourselves. Instead of using loving oneself as a means to shatter glass ceilings, I'll talk about myself to make somebody else feel good about themselves instead of revealing the power of the Lord working inside of me, in the community around me. But imagine, church, if we made the decision, not I won't talk about myself, because let me tell you something, every time you look in the mirror, you're not just looking at you, but you're looking at the Godhead that's in you. And let me tell you, you would never call on God and tell God that he's ugly. You would never call on God and tell God that he's fat. You would never call on God and tell God that he's too old. I wish y'all. You would never call on God and tell God he needs to lose some weight. You would never call on God and tell God he, your mama didn't like you. You would never call on God and tell God that your daddy didn't like you. You would never call on God and tell God that his hair ain't kinky enough. Let me tell you something, that when I look at the mirror, I see the God working in me, and I love God too much to hate myself. God, I wish y'all, I said I love God too much to hate myself. I'm old, but I look like my father. I'm young, am I talking to anybody? Today's the last day. I'm going to let what you say about me define who I am, because when I look in the mirror, I kiss myself because I'm loved. I kiss myself because I'm embraced. I kiss myself because somebody died for me, because God loves me beyond the walls I've created. The only person holding what you can't do against you is you. The only person stopping you is you. The only person that says you can't do it because when I read my Bible, my Bible said I can do all things. God, I wish I had. Through Christ, am I talking to anybody? I can go to school through Christ. I can get married through Christ. I can own the business through Christ who strengthens me. Here's what David's saying. You wake up tomorrow, church, and you kiss yourself in Jesus' name. And if somebody says you don't do it, you tell them, but you didn't die for me. God, I wish y'all. When you get up tomorrow morning, you hug yourself in Jesus' name. When you take yourself out to eat, in Jesus' name. And somebody said, why are you by yourself? My Bible said we're two or three are gathered. I wish y'all touching and agreeing. He'll be in the midst. Am I talking to anybody? I love God too much to hate myself. Now I ain't perfect, but God is searching me. Now I ain't got to figure it out, but God is searching me. My grandma put it like this, he's all over me, God, I wish y'all. And he's keeping me alive. He's, he's in my hands and in my feet, God, I wish. And he's keeping me alive. He's all over. And that's why I can say it like this. I walk like this because I back it up. I wish I had. I talk like this because I back it up. And it's not because I got a big ego, but the Lord is working on me, God. The Lord is proving me. So please be patient with me. The Lord ain't done with me. But when I get done, we 
embrace who we are, when we seek to see God working through us, you become revolutionary that build wills for roads that haven't even been paved yet. Uh, you become dominating forces towards justice. You become the tree of life in the midst of desolate wastelands. You become the lifeline of hope. Matter of fact, you become like the rose in concrete. When Tupac said, you wouldn't ask why the rose grew from concrete, had damaged petals. On the contrary, we would celebrate its tenacity. We would all love its reach towards the sun. Well, we are the rose, and this is the concrete, and these are my damaged petals. Don't ask me why, but thank God ask me how, because the reason I'm here today is but God. I wish y'all, the reason I'm alive today is but God. The reason I'm smiling today, and is there anybody in this building that can help me preach this sermon? Take 15 seconds and thank God with your but God testimony. But God made a way. But God opened the door. But God provided. But God opened the house. But God paid my bills. But God healed my body. But God brought me out if it had not been for the Lord. Woo! Who's on my, any, by any roses in concrete in this house this morning? Don't judge me praising God. the devil and shout unto God with a voice of triumph that I love me some me. I love the God in me. I love the joy in me. I love my hair. I love my body. I love my age. And if it had not been for the Lord on my side. Woo! How you gonna be scared now? Woo if God is working on your behalf. If God you fight the lion and bear, he'll defeat your boss. If he lets you fight that marriage, he'll get your marriage together because he loves you too much to let you down. So I'm going to say this and let you shout. Here's why that's so important. Because God did not give you the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. You have no reason to fear because he conquered death, hell, and the grave. a love me shout. I, I love me some me. I'm done. David says, I acknowledge. The, am I helping anybody this morning? David says, I acknowledge God's ability. I'm ready to go. Number two. Number two, I'm finished. I accept my own fragility. I'm done. I'm done. Notice how David moves in the text. David says, God, search me. Uh, then David says, watch the text. God, since you can search me, then test me. Uh, notice what David says. David says, God, don't just test anything, but test my mind. Uh, notice David does not say test my heart because as a man thinks in his heart, so he comes in his mind. David says, God, know my heart, but test my mind. Because David says, watch this, don't test my shout, test my source. God, that's so good. God, know my heart, but test my mind. God, test in me. Why do I really want this thing? Why do I really want this relationship? Test why I really want to be free. Test in me, God, why I really desire to be the thing that I'm praying for you to be. Because David says, listen, I know so much about God, the vastness of God. He acknowledges his own anxiety. Because David says, listen, God, when you search me, let me tell you what you're going to find. David says, know my anxious heart. <laughs> David says, listen, God, I'm going to cut to the chase before we start this thing out. God, when you test me, you're going to find some anxiety. Let me ask you a question. If God were to test your mind, what would God find? What are you anxious for? Who keeps you up at night? Notice David says, God, search me, test me, and find what I'm anxious about. Because this comes in the mind. And here David shows us something we often don't like. We like a feeling faith. But let me tell you something. Faith is not a feeling. Faith is a thinking thing. Our faith centers us and keeps us from worshiping idols, behavior like worshiping your enemies and worshiping your accomplishments, which destroys our faith. And so David says the way to acknowledge the ability of God is to have faith. 
Because faith, y'all, Paul Tillich said this, faith is not faith until you can articulate what you, your unbelief. And the problem where we've hurt ourselves, even in church, is people have destroyed themselves because we've made faith static. The human mind is, is in every function of faith, but faith that brings needs effort because you see yourself when you have faith, that faith defines your situation, whether that's defended by people of faith or not. The thing is, cognitive action does not do what is will. Cognitive action coerces us into an act with which what we already know about God, that faith articulates um, what I don't believe. I put that thing on the table, and when I begin to think about what God is able to do, my faith rises up and says, the very thing I didn't think God could do, I now know that God is able to do. See, feeling faith is not faith. That's subjective emotion. That's content-filled actions because faith has no faith when it's a feeling, but faith is faith when I'm thinking. See, I know what I can do, but faith says, listen, I know what I'm able to do, but my faith says I know what God can do because success is not the actualization of potential. It's the readiness to sacrifice your position to get closer in the kingdom of God. And David says, the way for me to overcome my emotions, the way for me to overcome my enemies, the way for me to overcome my pain is I know the fullness of God because I begin to think about God. And when I begin to think about how great God is, how awesome God is, how big God is, how vast God is, how wise God is, how powerful God is, how loving God is, how gracious God is, how awesome God is, when I begin to think about how good God is, my grandma said it like this, when I think of the goodness of Jesus, I wish y'all, and all that he's done for me, David says, I want to be people who think. Because David shows us, watch this, I want to shift my mind so my my feelings don't dictate my excellence. My feelings don't dictate my possibility, but my mind can do it. So God, David says, God, don't test my feelings, but test my mind. Because here it is, God, if you test my mind, I'll fix my feelings. Quit asking God to fix your face. You fix your face. But God, test why I want to act like that among them folk. I wish y'all talked to me. God, don't fix my tone. I'll fix my tone. But God, change the root of bitterness I have towards those people that I even give them that tone. God, don't fix my eye roll. I'll stop rolling my eyes. I'll stop snapping my neck, but fix the trauma that makes me project my insecurity on people that don't deserve it. Quit asking God to fix your feelings and say, God, fix my mind, because when God begins to fix your mind, he'll put your mind on things that are lovely, mind on things that are pure, mind on things that have good report, and when you think on those things, my Bible said he'll give your peace that surpasses all understanding with your mind stayed on Jesus Christ. I'm done. David says, I acknowledge the ability of God. I accept my fragility in God. But thirdly and finally, I've learned to activate my joy. When I chill with God, I acknowledge his ability. I accept, I accept my fragility. But thirdly and finally, I activate my internal internal joy. Notice the text. David says, so God, search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Test my mind. Then the end of the text says, and then God, lead me in your everlasting path. Here's what shouts me. David says, God, lead me on a path I can't even describe. Lead me in your pathway everlasting. Because when you get your mind right and you chill out with God, God leads you in places that you can't even describe. My Bible put it like this, and he'll lead you beside still waters, and he'll restore your soul. God will take you to places that eyes have never seen, and ears have never heard, because I still believe that God is still able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all you can ask, think, or imagine, that when you chill out with God and say, God, lead me, God gives you, gives, shows you a blank canvas that he'll paint with broad brush strokes, and show you that the place you're praying for, I've all already prepared it for you. Because when you finally give your life over to God, it allows God to move you without you even moving. Because if you're constantly searching for your future and constantly searching for next level and constantly searching for where to go and constantly searching for who to talk to, you're going to get yourself lost. But here's your fight. Learn to stop and let God lead you. Listen, I know you're smart. I do. You're brilliant. You got all them degrees and all that type of stuff. But let me tell you something. Let God lead you. I know, I know, I know, I know you can fix your words and slice and dice somebody. But let God lead you. I know you got it together and you can cuss them all the way out back to heaven, down to hell, back into purgatory and back up to this area. But let me tell you something. Let God lead you. 
I know you got it together. I know you got your life together, but let God lead you. That is God will lead you in the place where God calls everlasting. He'll lead you in the place where God calls full of peace. God will lead you to a place where God says, this is where I rest. The hardest prayer to pray in all of scripture is verses 23 and 24. The hardest prayer to pray. Imagine if you prayed every single day. And that's my challenge for you this month as we wrestle with emotions. God, search me, oh God. Know my heart, test my mind, and lead me where you already are. It's the hardest prayer to pray in scripture because that prayer says, God, I'm not going to do it. I'm taking my hands off of it. I know what my emotions want to say, want to say and do. I know what my degrees want to say and do. But God, you know what? Search me. Know me. Test me. And then lead me. There's an old song we used to sing that, that said, lead me, guide me along the way. For if you lead me, I cannot stray. Lord, let me walk each day with thee. Lead me, O oh Lord. Lead me. Another song, put it like this, where he leads me, I'll follow. I'll go with him all the way. My challenge to you, church, in this season of your life, when it comes to your emotions, when you get to those places where you don't know what to do, David shows us in verse 14, God, hold up, search me, oh God. Know my heart, test my mind, and then God, I know what I want to do, but lead me where you already are. 